Okay, so yeah, thank you very much for, for having me today. Um, so in this paper today, I'm going to talk about some of the research I've been doing on my uh, PhD. I mentioned earlier that I'm in my fourth year, but I am uh, one of those pandemic PhDs, so it's made it a bit harder. I've also had uh, a placement break and some sick leave as well, so I'm, I'm slightly further behind than I'd like to be. Um, but I'm going to consider the reasons why people maybe choose to leave their mark when visiting historical heritage sites and how this practice may have been influenced over time with the introduction of official heritage management procedures and with specific reference to the graffiti recorded at Kirby Hall and Elizabethan House in Northamptonshire, which is now in the care of English Heritage, who's my collaborative partner. So that's Kirby Hall there. So these personal identifier marks can include names, initials, dates, uh, such as dates of when people visit, places, and with more recent marks, even social media handles people leave. And the idea of leaving a personal identifier mark on a heritage or historic site may show a desire of an individual or group to record their visit to the site, to mark their presence within a particular space in a, in a particular period of time, potentially due to boredom or even risk-taking behavior, depending on where it's left, to connect with the site and its history, either for personal reasons or create a connection with the past, uh, inspired by other marks on the site, uh, because maybe people feel that it's more permissible to leave marks with the presence of others, uh, maybe to be part of an historic community of mark makers over time, or a wish uh, potentially to be remembered for posterity in a place where memory and history are more likely to be at the forefront of people's minds when visiting. This is just a few potential ideas maybe of why people are doing this. Um, furthermore, for many modern individuals when visiting heritage and cultural sites, it can be a tradition to take something physical away with them, usually by purchasing an item such as a postcard or a piece of stationery or guidebook from the site's gift shop. And such keepsakes to commemorate a visit may also include the act of taking a photograph of the site. However, these souvenirs usually function as mementos or keepsakes taken away from the site itself and transported home. However, when it comes to potential visitor marks, maybe the souvenir is the visit to Maybe the souvenir of the visit is the memento which is left behind and physically marked onto the site itself through graffiti. So there's evidence uh, as early as 17th and 18th centuries, but as we found out today much earlier, of tourists and travellers leaving graffiti when visiting cultural and historic sites, including when travelling as part of the Grand Tour, a traditional tour through Europe by young men of sufficient means when they had come of age. And as tourism in Britain vastly increased in the 19th century, this practice of leaving behind graffiti seems to have become also more common. And through a scoping exercise of various English heritage sites, I've been to about 70, um, I found many marks in this period. It was also during the 19th century that there was an increased focus on preservation of historic sites and when national heritage management practices were introduced, most notably the Ancient Monuments Protection Act of 1882. And this first legislation for the preservation of archaeological and historic sites in Britain, where arrangements were made for the guardianship of around 50 prehistoric sites and the appointment of an inspector of ancient monuments. And this growing heritization of the late 19th century, and early 20th centuries, meant, century, meant that uh, these, these places were designated as heritage sites and were reframed with increased focus on preservation and conservation. So as the context for these places changed, so too did the ways in which people were supposed to interact with them. And a destructive act like graffiti can be viewed as the antithesis to the preservation attitudes of heritage discourse and management. And Laura Jane Smith has argued that heritage is not just about the status of cultural value and meanings, but may equally be about cultural change. And these changing attitudes that occur due to the heritization process of these sites also form part of the heritage of the sites as well. And at places such as Kirby Hall, depending on the context of the graffiti, some marks may be seen as causing a loss to heritage and simultaneously also being part of the heritage of the site as well, as they add to its story and reflect changing attitudes. So as many of us know, in England and Wales, graffiti was considered an act of criminal damage under the Criminal Damage Act of 1971, where a person who, without lawful exercise, destroys or damages another property belonging to a uh, someone else um, with the intent to destroy or damage that property and shall be guilty of an offence. Furthermore, offensive graffiti is also a hate crime and leaving graffiti on a heritage asset such as Kirby Hall uh, or another scheduled monument listed building, world heritage site or conservation area also constitutes a heritage crime. 
But due to this increased focus on preservation within heritage and the perception and classification of graffiti as a criminal act, the practice of leaving graffiti on heritage sites is now highly discouraged. Please don't leave them on the H sites. Uh, but unfortunately, it continues to occur in some spaces and settings to this day. And historic sites were a tradition of mark making practices. Such graffiti can be examined to reveal the changing relationships between sites and their visitors, how the context of these sites has changed over time through this process of heritageization. Uh, for example, Historic England guidance uh, highlights how the prehistoric site of Stonehenge uh, has attracted visitors throughout its history, with many leaving their marks by scratching their names or, or dates into the stones. However, such action would now constitute damage to a scheduled monument and probably be pretty horror, uh, bring a lot of horror. Uh, so in terms of the uh, history of Kirby Hall, one of the sites that I've looked at, um, I decided to test out various methodological approaches when it came to historical graffiti research. And in the summer of, and autumn of 2021, I conducted a full site survey of Kirby Hall in Northamptonshire, which now seems foolish because uh, it was very extensive. And by taking such a large scale approach, uh, I've been able to use the resulting data to conduct a spatial analysis, analysis of the graffiti at Kirby Hall, whilst also being able to research some of the individual stories of these marks. So some context about the site. Uh, the building of Kirby Hall began in 1570 by Sir Humphrey Stafford and then was completed by Sir Christopher Hatton, one of Elizabeth I, Queen Elizabeth I's favourite courtiers. It was modified during several building campaigns in the first hundred years of its history, but then became less occupied in the 18th century and was largely abandoned and fell into ruin in the early 19th century. In 1891, George William Finch Hatton was born, born at Kirby Hall and later celebrated his 21st birthday there in 1812. And George and his wife Georgina lived at Kirby Hall on and off until they inherited the family estates in 1823, when they then moved to Eastwell Park in Kent and put their furniture at Kirby Hall up for sale in 1824. And after this, Kirby Hall ceased to be regularly inhabited by the family and began to be largely neglected. And reflecting on the site's growing deterioration, in 1828, the historian John Nichols wrote that Kirby Hall was dismantled and going fast to decay. And a few decades later in 1857, the Reverend Canon James wrote of the very action of decomposition going on, the crumbling stucco of the ceiling feeding the vampire ivy, the tap tattered tapestry yet hanging on the wall, the picture flapping in its broken frame. After inheriting the site in 1887, Murray Finch Hatton, the 12th Earl of Winchelsea, expressed a desire to at least preserve the ruins of the site and occasionally use the grounds for picnics and bazaars. Though his money was not spent on it, it continued to deteriorate, but became a popular attraction for both the simply curious and antiquarians interested in Elizabethan architecture, and there's apparently no difficulty in visiting the site. Formal tours of the site began in 1882, when the Architectural Association visited the property, and in 1888, the 12th Earl of Wenchelsea included his ancient home of Kirby Hall in a promotional tour of the nearby Weldon Quarry. And a year later, in 1889, uh, the site was, include, uh, was included in Richard Green's cycling guide, which gave a general architectural description and illustrated an interest in the romantic qualities of a ruin. Green likened Kirby Hall to a petrified poem, an epic poem in stone, further adding that to some of us, it may possibly be more fascinating as a ruin than it would be interesting as a palace. And in 1918, cyclist Herbert Evans visited the site and found that the shepherd and his family uh, who were tenants in one corner of the mansion would give you a cordial welcome. That's that one. The final internal fittings to the site were then removed in 1919 and the building was deemed structurally unsound, as you can see here. And the Ministry of Works took over management and the property in 1930 when the 12th Earl of Winchelsea signed a deal of guardianship and transferred the care of Kirby Hall over to the government. And then from the 1930s to the 60s, the Office of Works pursued a programme of repair and consolidation focusing on the original fabric at expense of later additions. So the 17th and 18th century phases were stripped out. And then following the formation of English Heritage in 1983, staff tried to make better sense of the interiors in the 1980s, and archaeological excavations took place from 18, 1987 to 1994, which revealed more about the 17th century parterre gardens. And then finally, from 2002 to 2004, the roof state rooms and the Great Hall were redecorated to get a better yet a better balance of Kirby Hall. 
So evidence of a variety of graffiti across the site was noted during a 2012 uh, survey of the Mason Marks conducted by Jennifer Alexander and a team of students from Warwick University's Art History Department. This survey examined all accessible exterior and interior stonework surfaces, excluding any areas which would have required scaffolding. And the Mason Mark survey found uh, 137 different marks and around 939 total marks recorded. Um, and during this survey, um, during the 2021 graffiti survey of my, my own, akin to the 2012 Mason Mark survey, all the graffiti that could be found in the accessible indoor and outdoor areas were recorded and photographed. And during this full site survey, um, I found 2,752 graffiti marks. And there's some overlap with the Mesa marks. I'm going to take those out so that they can be a comparable data set. Um, the areas of the highest concentration of graffiti recorded at Kirby Hall were the attic, uh, east lodgings, west lodgings, great chamber, the hall on the ground floor, the servants quarter and the outer wall of the hall. So a lot of the outdoor areas which are now ruined. Of the marks uh, found and recorded at Kirby Hall, 337 graffiti marks were accompanied by dates. Most of these dated marks included a year, so 321 graffiti, with many of them including other information, such as the day of the week, day or month, and a few also actually included the exact time of the graffiti being left. So you can see, uh, for example, from this, there's a lot of marks in the attic from the 1950s to 1999, and also a, a lot um, from if, when comparing across the site in the attic, from the late 19th century. So these dated marks range from 1757 to 2021. I'm pretty sure some of the 2021 marks were made during the point when I was recording. Um, and the earliest dated mark is TB 1757. It's located in a niche on the east side of the outer wall of the outer courtyard, which was the original entrance to Kirby Hall. At this point, Kirby Hall was in the ownership of Edward Finch Hatton, who inherited the site in 1762. And Finch Hatton used the site quite a bit until he inherited Eastwell Park in 1769. The next dated mark, so WC 1771, which is located uh, twice, both on a column in the lodger and in the South Forecourt, uh, created the year that Edward Finch Hatton died and one year after he left Kirby Hall. There are also dated marks from 1817, two from 1820 and two from 1826. Uh, from 1814, George and Georgina Finch Hatton were living at Kirby Hall on and off, but moved to Eastwell Park in 1823. And in 1826, when those two marks are dated, a tenant farmer was reportedly living in a corner of the hall, most likely the library. Uh, and then there's no further dated marks until 1863. Uh, overall, there's four dated marks from the 18th century and 42 from the 19th century. And of these 42 from the 19th century, uh, nearly 80% were left in the 1860s uh, and up to 1899. And most of these marks are in the attic, cloister and forecourt, and on a door, a 19, the door from the 1670s on display in the pallet chamber and in the great chamber. Uh, so the 1860s to 1880s may reflect a period in time in which informal tours of Kirby Hall were taking place to see the site in its ruined state. Whilst formal tours of the site began in 1882, when the Architectural Association visited the property. At some point in the 1880s, it's not clear because we've kind of lost the date, but a poster was put up by the agent, an, uh, agent of the Earl of Winchelsea in Nottingham, warning against the leaving of names and general defacement of the site. And 19 dated marks were found from the 1880s, but only four marks from the 1890s. And 1886 is a particularly popular year. This could potentially reflect the change in visitor behaviour on site, due to the introduction of these formal tours in 1888 and the anti-defacement sign. 50% of the data marks in the 1880s were found in the attic, potentially indicating that these 19th century visitors were able to visit the space as part of their informal tours. And only one data mark in the attic can be found in the attic from the 1890s, whereas there's no more data marks uh, until 1958 in the attic, showing how this practice may have stopped or at least decreased. Um, so from the 1940s onwards, there was a steady increase in data marks with three in the 1940s, 11 in the 1950s, 14 in the 1960s, and then 44 in the 1970s and 46 in the 1980s. And there's a number of data marks in the attic from uh, 1979 to 1982, with most of these marks from 1981 and 1982. 
Many of these can be found in the attic and are surrounded by other marks which are similar in style or content, so being they're probably made at the same time or around a similar time. And site manager Beryl Sh uh, Spearman has stated that many of these graffiti were left by, left by Ministry of Work staff and apprentices working at Kirby Hall who were probably using the attic as their own space. Thus, these marks were made uh, in the years prior to the formation of English Heritage under the National Heritage Act of 1983, and maybe a shift happened on site after this point. And Simon Thurley has written that there was an increased effort with Kirby Hall during the 1980s to do something to make better sense of the interior stripped out by the Ministry of Works. And there was also a period from 1987 to 1984 where there was garden archaeology taking place. Uh, but there's only three marks from that period of the garden archaeology showing that the practice may have stopped or decreased. So this is one of the marks that someone made when I think I was recording. Um, not exactly when I was recording, but during the period of time. So there's 55 marks from the 20, data from the 21st century, um, and 39 of these, or 70, around 70%, were found in the outdoor areas, with the highest concentration of marks found in the West Lodgings, East Lodgings, Servants' Courtyard, and Inner Courtyard. Um, and many of these are found in areas which are hidden and which, uh, where the mark maker would be less likely to be caught when leaving graffiti. So just showing you how the practice has changed. Um, we can also look at the months recorded or mentioned as well in the graffiti. Uh, so 106 marks reference a month, uh, and those most referenced were the summer months of June, July, and August, with these three months accounting for 64% of the references. And it could be argued that the dates of graffiti reflects that the months of the visitors were most likely to visit Kirby Hall due to the good weather and the longer hours of the staff, uh, the staff were working at the site. Um, I've also looked at the places with reference in the graffiti. So a small number of those uh, on the site reference places at 67 marks. And these give an interesting indication of the types of places visitors or staff members may have traveled from or been connected to. And most of these spaces, uh, places mentioned are local to Kirby Hall with 57% referencing places in Northamptonshire, such as Kettering, Corby, Aundel, Finnerden, Isham, Northampton, Northampton, Dean and Rockingham. So most likely visitors were coming from close by rather than from further afield. Um, there's a variety of materials that were used to make the graffiti at Kirby Hall, including carving or scratching the marks into the surface using pencil, pen, crayon, chalk or paint uh, being marked onto the building. And from the survey, it's been clear that from the marks in the early 20th century onwards, so post-1918 actually, are not as deeply marked and are fewer carved marks. And this may reflect how modern and contemporary visitors to Kirby Hall had and have less time to leave more complex, deep and time consuming marks in comparison to their historic counterparts. Most of the marks on site are text based, so 2,211, uh, 340 recorded as unknown, and then there are 97 drawings and 26 which are both text and drawings and a smaller variety of other marks. Uh, of the text based um, marks, 720 are names and 520 are initials, so 45% of the marks across the site, so it's a place where people like to leave their names. Um, there's also, like I say, almost 300 dates, uh, 88 general messages, 61 place names, 31 that literally say I was here or someone was here, uh, 35 technical drawings, 22 interestingly in French, which is still a mystery to me, uh, 16 rude marks, uh, which meant actually when I tried to send a spreadsheet to an English heritage colleague, uh, it got blocked because of the rudeness in the spreadsheets, the profanity. So um, nine greetings, seven love messages, and four which reference band names or references. And like I said, three which also reference the exact time that someone left the mark. Of the more image-based graffiti, there are eight animals, three of the face or body, uh, three trowels. I really like these two, which are in the attic. Uh, some doors or windows, smiles, and one game of noughts or crosses. So the data from the full site survey of Kirby Hall can give a further a potential further insight into how people have used various spaces within the site over the course of its history. And an interesting example of this can be found when comparing marks recorded in the billiard room and those found in the library next door. And from this survey, 141 graffiti were found in the billiard room. And most of these graffiti, so 137 marks, were located in this south window. Um, and although many of these marks are made in pencil and no longer re readable, the presence of such a high concentration of graffiti here is interesting. In contrast, in the room next door, which is identical, only eight marks were found in the library, uh, six of which were in the south window. So you've got 141 to eight. 
Uh, and so this highest con higher concentration of marks in the billiard room in comparison to the library may reflect periods of time when the library was in private use. Lady Constance, a member of the family, wrote that after the Earl left in the early 19th century, it was occupied by the Earl's agent and afterwards by a labourer who was living in the library. And in 1930, when the Ministry of Works took over management of the property in 19, uh, the estate's former shepherd and his wife were installed as custodians along with their cat and Alsatian puppies and remained there until 1952, doing their cooking on the range installed in a large fireplace in the library. So this lack of marks there may reflect how this room was inhabited by these custodians of the site who used it as their own personal living space, space meaning that it would have been open or accessible to the public. In addition to this, these rooms were altered to improve their appearance in the 1960s and 70s, which may explain the high concentration of marks in the south windows of the rooms in comparison to the rest of the room if the graffiti has only survived on these uh, stone window frames. So alongside that, I've also uh, looked at some kind of like specific marks as well. So this isn't one I've looked at, but it's interesting to know that it's included in the visitor interpretation now. So we've gone from marks being removed on site to now becoming part of the very uh, kind of story of the site. And from this survey, there's a few examples of uh, groups of visitors or staff leaving graffiti on the same day and even at the same time and in the same area. So now, like I say, included in the visitor interpretation is W. Bennett and L.C. Richards, who both left well-defined graffiti marks on a column in the loggia on 17th of August, 1880. Uh, and the following information was found by a visitor who came uh, and wanted to research this after coming to Kirby Hall. So they say W. Bennett, Aundel, 1880, August 17th, um, which is William Bennett, who was born in Aundel in 1860 or 1861. And he would have been aged 20 when visiting. He was recorded in the census um, are still living at home in Aundel at this point and was working as a painter journeyman. And then Elsie Richards Aundel, August 17th, 1880, is Lacey Colbert Richards, who was born also in 1860, who was uh, born in Aundel. And he would have been aged 20 when visiting the site as well, but was at that time working as a tailor in Nuneaton. So it's a story of kind of two local lads, one of them coming back and then both going to the site and leaving their mark. Um, another mark that I've looked at is W. Moore Corby, 1884, who was recorded, and I think I found a William R. Morby, Moore of Corby, who was recorded in the 1881 census, who would have been 15 in 1881, born around 1866, and around 18 at the time of visiting Kirby Hall. And in the 1881 census, his occupation was listed as a painter, and was recorded as living in Kirby, at Kirby, in Corby, sorry, with his mother, Mary Moore, who was 56 and listed as a widow whose income was derived from land. Um, sadly though, I think I found a record that he might have passed away three years after he left this mark. So it kind of becomes a very different story. Um, I'll just skip over and I'll finish. I've gone over a bit on the last one. Uh, so this is one of the interesting marks that I found at site. Um, this is in the attic where it's very clear and easy to see um, other than the date on one of the marks. And they're located really close to one another in the same wall. And I think it's possible. I was like, oh, I recognise Armstrong Jones. Where do I recognise that name from? Uh, and actually, I think it might be Anthony Armstrong Jones, who was the first Earl of Snowden um, and once the husband of Princess Margaret. And nearby, it was M. Andrews. So I was like, I'll look that up too, because he's uh, they're both from London. Uh, and M. Andrews might be Michael Andrews or Michael James Andrews, who was associated with the painters of school in London. And Armstrong Jones had a photography studio in Pimlico, London. And so it says Pimlico. Um, and Andrews was a painter who lived in London and taught at the Chelsea School of Art and Slade School of Fine Art, uh, both in London. They knew one another, and there's evidence of this due to a photograph of Andrews in his, uh, in his Islington studio uh, by Lord Snowden, which is now in the National Portrait Gallery collection. So it's potential, I still need to look into it, but maybe. And finally, just a, a few marks at Kirby Hall, um, so when analysing, uh, sorry, I'm just trying to finish. Um, so the marks at Kirby Hall may include graffiti left by artists and a husband of the royal family to tradesmen such as painters and tailors, as well as staff members, apprentices and modern day tourists. The graffiti reveal layers, layers of history connecting uh, the visitors of Kirby Hall across time and social status, all of whom allow linked to one another as they quite literally made their mark and embedded themselves into heritage. And whilst analysing historic and contemporary graffiti can help to reveal further information about a site's history, reflect heritage management choices and demonstrate the changing relationship between sites and those that interact with them, 
Such marks can also raise more interesting questions. For example, on one of the unpainted doors from the 1670s, which is now on display in the pallet chamber, a variety of 19th century graffiti written in French can be found, including something which looks like the devil coming home here with his wife, and the devil here, um, devil and his, and his children danced here beautiful. So further questions are raised, such as who left these graffiti, who were they referring to, and who did they consider to be the devil of Kirby Hall? So yeah, thank you very much.